Welcome to At The Controls, Twit's new video game show. We are still in beta, but we are live and on the air right now. I am your host, Glenn Rubenstein, and with me, as always, Brian Brushwood. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. How the hell are you, Glenn? I am doing good, and today it is just the two of us. We have quite possibly the two most loquacious hosts in the entire Twit broadcasting empire, unrefereed, unsupervised. <laughs> what? And we use a lot of words. We're very verbose and verbiage laden. And we speak nonstop bully. The only I'm thing we love a- more than the sound of each other's voice is the sound of our own. <laughs> uh, no, this will be a good one. We'll try to keep everything going along. We're going to have an imaginary, imagine like a floating ghosty kind of Ayaz and a floating ghosty Tom. They're each telling us like, move along, gentlemen, move along the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started with some news. And uh, I guess the first thing that struck me as pretty cool, just when I saw the headline, I was like, oh man, this is going to be awesome. Portal 2 DLC, but it's exclusive to the Hydra motion controller. And uh, do you know about this, Brian? Yeah, I do. When, as a matter of fact, we got to see people playing the game. And so, in fact, the footage that I'm looking at it right now in the uh, uh, in the steam powered. I'm looking at the link right now. If we can throw that up there, the footage is exactly what we saw this exact level when we were at CES and we went and visited the folks over at uh, at Razor. Uh, it's really cool because not only not only is it uh, take advantage of the Six Sense controllers, but there's there's unique abilities that you have that you could only do on it. For example, I think right here you're about to see uh, it resize. He actually physically makes it bigger, which gives the box more mass. And uh, here you can see he's going to walk out. He'll pick up the box and he'll walk forward. And the reason is, is if you were to just drop the box straight down on this glass, the glass would not break. But by pulling it apart and stretching it out, he adds mass to it. And then when it drops down, it'll shatter the glass down there. I thought it was uh, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, and there's, what, like six levels available of DLC uh, if you buy the bundle through Steam, which is available as of yesterday. It's uh, one little setback, though. What's the final cost on that? Like $139.99. Tell you what, man, that's the price you pay for any kind <laughs> of novel control like this. It's one of those things it's, where... It's, it's the Wii Nunchuck, man. I, I mean, I it mean, isn't, it isn't. It's, it's don't you think? Size. I mean, you should see, like, seeing it in person, it really is tracking. And first of all, one of the things, the, the Wii Nunchuck, uh, the Wii only is able to figure out relative position uh-huh. based on, on the lights. This thing actually uses, like, um, like a mini GPS thing. There's, like, a, a base system, and it actually... It actually figures out uh, absolute position. So that's what allows you to, um, there you go. You can actually, it, it knows at all time precisely where both of your hands are, which gives it some more precision. I mean, it's cool. I mean, you know, let me just say that if somebody sent me one of these, I'm sure I would play it and love it. But for 140 bucks now, although I must say for $140, you do get the controller, the uh, Razer Hydra PC gaming motion sensing controller which that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it is only for PC, but you also get a copy of Portal 2. So if you're one of the rare hardcore PC gamers that does not own Portal, Portal 2 yet, uh, you know, it's bundled in with this. It's interesting, though, like buying a controller through Steam, you know? Yeah, well, and it's uh, it makes sense, though. I mean, they're, they're the largest online store for gamers, you know, with an established, with built-in platform of, I forget how many million Oh, definitely. Yeah. But it uh, makes sense, but it, it is a bit of a brand extension. I'll tell you what's smart about this is every so often you get these really novel controls. Do you remember some of the VR headsets that you could get I, back? In I the own a scuba headset still, the VR and, scuba headset. Yes. And the, the, and the truth is you would put it on and you essentially played just the one game that it came with. Yeah, and in yeah, this yeah. case, uh, you could do worse than have the one game you're playing be Portal 2, and you could do worse than spend $150. That is a bit much. I, I got to be admit, I'm pretty skeptical of whether or not this is going to take off. It all boils down t- to what kind of support that they have for the games. That's always the catch-22. It's like you got to have the games support the device so people want the device, but nobody wants to develop the support for the games until people have the device. Well, and the, what are they saying? though? They're saying it works with like 100 and some odd games out of the box, though, right? Yeah, and, and again, I, I don't know for sure what it's going to be like if it's the type of thing you're like, oh, finally, I can play StarCraft with my hands in space. And maybe that is fun. Maybe it's the kind of thing that uh-huh. feels like doing Minority Report. But <laughs> Isn't it weird that Minority Report has become the point of reference for, for everything? I don't know why that is. Either. It was such a terrible it, movie on so many know. levels. No, no, no. That was, <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, I actually really like Minority Report. Really? Re- because, well, Even the third act. 
especially after uh, so much of like a decade of schmaltz from Steven Spielberg. It's like behind an old crusty sandwich, he found his balls in the refrigerator. And he was just like, oh, right on. And so he had some grit. Is that, that where one day. keeps their balls really behind a crusty sandwich in the refrigerator? Is that really the best storage yeah, place? That's, that's a recreation of the moment that he realized that he was truly. Oh, that's where they are. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, no, I liked Minor Minority Report, but yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't know that this thing's going to explode unless there's some kind of must-have game for it. You can't have. I, I suspect that you can't have a game that everybody already experiences and said, "Hey, you could get like 10, 15 percent, twenty percent more awesome if you buy this hundred and fifty dollar gizmo." Well, and I'll nobody, tell nobody you. I mean, for me, I, I would say Portal 2 is is that game, except it's only six unique levels that use that controller that are available as part of this bundle. If well, it, keep in mind, you, know, you, you can play with the regular thing, but you notice that, that what you don't have is the ability to reform and reshape. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. It's awesome that they added an entire new play dynamic to Portal 2. That's what really excites me about it. Yeah, but but again, it's one of those things where the $150 price tag, I, I suspect it, that, and, and plus, most people already got most of the experience of Portal 2. I, I don't see a lot of people spending the coin, this much coin, just to get a little bit of extra. Oh, well, that's really awesome on top. In fact, you know what? Huge missed opportunity. Why didn't they do Portal 2 for the Wii and have this be an exclusive Wii add-on or even, you know, Microsoft uh, with the Connect on the 360? Handle it. We couldn't well, handle it. But they something, you know what I mean? It just seems yeah. like something. There would have been an opportunity there. But you're right. I mean, it, the, with the Wii, it's not quite as not quite as accurate. I mean, that, that's my main complaint about the Wii is it seems like so much of the motion control is just the illusion of really controlling it when really it's, you know, you, you're just shaking it like a monkey. It's like the uh, yeah on the connect. The equivalent is: Have you seen the video of the guy that does nothing but stand there like this the entire game through the racing game and <laughs> just second place? Like like the auto the auto correction is so much that it, you know just doing nothing he's able to take second. Well, speaking of uh, the connect and PC peripherals, Microsoft has released the connect dev tools for Windows, for the PC, so now developers can start using them um, to do their own PC applications, both in gaming and otherwise, uh, using the uh, Xbox Connect. You know, the uh, this you're, you're talking about the actual Xbox Connect hardware, like you would just grab it straight off your Xbox and plug it into your, your physical PC, and then you'd be able to... Uh, you'd be able to d start writing whatever you want. People have right? been make, doing hacks for this, but this is now, I mean, it's been going on for, for quite a bit, but this is an official SDK that actually makes it much easier for developers to just pick up, hook it up, and actually write for uh, the, using Connect controls in PC applications and games. I tell you what, man, I give it less than a year, possibly as little as eight months before somebody writes a program where you go and you just buy three of these connects. You, you set them up in different corners of the room and then you have a fully functional uh, video or full motion capture studio for like a thousand bucks. But if only like the cameras weren't so, I don't know, I, I find the camera a bit lacking in that regard. I guess for motion capture, you could do it if you had uh But again, it, I mean, you can theoretically, from a scientific standpoint, all you need to do is to increase the fidelity is just add more cameras, right? Because then you're covering from theory, more. Yeah. You're, you're able to, you know, even if it's kind of blurry in areas, you're able to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, I guess, average out over the different uh, viewpoints and get more and more precise. I mean, that's what they do with uh, with GPS systems, don't they? They uh, they have GPS systems that run, because uh, I believe the GPS units that commercial, or yeah, commercial grade, you, you cannot be as precise as the military grade ones. So the way a lot of engineers get around that is they just buy like three of the commercial grade yeah. ones. And then they're able to average out and get the correct answer. Now, I mean, one important note is that this is a non-commercial license that they're granting with the SDK. So uh, according to this article on 1UP, it's geared primarily towards the academic and enthusiast communities. But what I think is awesome about it is people have been doing these connect hacks now since really the launch of the device. And this is Microsoft further, uh, I mean, encouraging it in a way to, to make it easier for people to mess around with it. And I think it makes sense since they've used a lot of connect hacks uh, in some of the stuff they announced at E3 as far as, you know, new features and ways to integrate the connect into the xbox experience so i mean yeah. it's cool that I, I think it's cool that we're seeing a company and microsoft you know i mean they get they get a lot of guff for a variety of reasons but it's cool to see a company working with the hacker community and you know it's not quite open source but it's definitely i think extending an olive branch towards more of these uh homebrew connect hacks
Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I would I would say that um, I, I think it's right for them to recognize that there is a place for a tightly controlled consumer experience and it's called on the Xbox. And then there's a place to open up the sandbox and get a more kind of Android open source environment. And that is on the PC. And of course, and it, and it is possible for Microsoft to play both ways, depending on what device that they're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's definitely cool. And it's, you know, when we see all the stories about people, you know, trying to sort of shut down the sort of open source tinkering, I think it's awesome to see it more encouraged from a major company. Um, moving on to our next story. Uh, as of today, Redbox Game Rentals go nationwide. Which uh, no. Okay, now you're talking about physical location. You still physical. physically have to go to a red you box. You physically then, have to go to red box, but they're everywhere. At least here in California, in the North Bay, I mean, 7-Eleven, the supermarkets. I mean, I cannot, you know, seem to avoid red box uh, uh, kiosks, at least in my day-to-day -day experience. I don't know how it is out there. Well, and so uh, uh, when's the last time you rented a game? Do you rent games? You know, not really. I should rent games more often. Um, and I, because especially it, it feels like, you know, when you, when you just want to be able to play something and check it out instantly, it's, I don't know, Redbox is a little more convenient than going to a Blockbuster. See, that's the thing. I'm just trying to think Blockbuster Hollywood video. I got so deep in late fees with both of those establishments that it's been a while since I've yeah. rented a game. Gamefly I did for a little while, you know, but uh, I, I like more the immediacy of it. You know, if I just want to pick something up and, and play it right away. I know, but but it, but it's, if, if it's really immediacy you want, now you got Steam. I mean, if you're a PC gamer, and I understand it's different for console, but nowadays, I mean, even a lot of, uh, uh, like my daughter really wanted to, me to play Katamari Damacy, but I didn't have mm -hmm. my PS2 hooked up. So I just went online and found Xbox uh, Beautiful Katamari, had it within like 20 minutes. Um I, but, I, I don't know. But the I, cost, I, I, though, you're forgetting the cost factor. I mean, we're talking $2, $2 per day to rent games. Now, think about, I mean, even Portal 2 games like that, that, you know, in theory, you, you could blow through Portal 2 over a weekend. You could blow through probably in a day if you were hardcore enough. Yeah, but then, uh, but then again, I, oh, I mean, I, I, they're different experiences. I guess the difference is, is you know, obviously the the flip side of that is something like the GameFly experience. But, uh, but, the, but for GameFly, you already have to be a member and you have to put mm -hmm. it in your queue and you have to wait for it. But if you just, you know, are Jones and you're like, I gotta play this. Somebody said this is the greatest game ever, and I could totally see if you're having a party and you know you're not gonna play. You know, for example, you don't know Jack or something like that. You're like, I just want it for a couple of nights. We're gonna play it and then we'll be done with it. Then th that could be a very good deal. Any word on what a Availability of titles there are? Yeah, okay, so the launch titles for Rent are uh, Brink, Call of Duty Black Ops, uh, Duke Nukem Forever, Family Party, Infamous 2, which just came out, very hot game, Just Dance 2, L.A. Noir, Lego Pirates of the Caribbean, Michael Jackson, The Experience, Red Faction Armageddon, Rio, Transformers, Dark of the Moon, and You Don't Know Jack for the 360. So for $2 a day, now it's console only, but for $2 a day, I mean, and this is the thing, I love PC gaming, and I love so many things that PC games offer in terms of the depth and flexibility that you have over games, but when it comes to just being able to you pick up and play the rental experience that, yeah. I mean, I hate that I can't rent a PC game, you know, that yes. really, I mean, because essentially you're at the demo level where you're at the, at the, at the mercy of the publisher and what they're willing to put out there for free, or we're talking 40 to $60 to be able to experience the game. And sometimes, you know, th there have been games that I've, I've been, that I've purchased and I've been sorely disappointed that I was done with it uh, in a day or two, or it just didn't click for me. And here's the other big drawback with PC games, um, which, you know, I know obviously in the chat realm is definitely more PC heavy. And in my heart, I consider myself a PC gamer. But there's not even a real legit used market for PC games, which bums me out. You have no recourse if you buy a game that completely sucks. Right, right, totally. Well, and I'll tell you, seeing that list, for some reason, I imagined seeing that list as I'm driving forward and my kids are screaming in the back for a Happy Meal or something, and I'm driving past the red box waiting in line at McDonald's, and I see that list of games, I could totally see like an impulse buy type of game I normally wouldn't pick because, again, it's like uh, I'm not going to drive out to the mall just to pick up L.A. Noir, but I'll pick it up and gobble it up in two days, spend six bucks, and then go... Send it back to McDonald's the next day. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm seeing this now, and especially mm -hmm. if you don't know Jack thing, because that that actually the reboot is really really good. 
of you don't know Jack. The only problem is on the PC, you can only have two players. And to be honest, yeah. it's the kind of thing that really belongs out in the living room anyway. Well, I mean, or even look at for what we do here on the show. I mean, obviously, you know, and we'll talk about this a bit later in terms of, you know, being at the mercy of publishers if we want to get something uh, without having to pay for it or having to fork over our hard-earned money just like you guys do and buy the games. I mean, think about, you know, some of the games we've even covered on the show and made our, you know, pinky promise to uh, to try and play the game. I mean, even for Brink or uh, L.A. Noir or something like this, I mean, would give us the opportunity to quickly and easily check something out without having to make a huge investment. Now, there's no kind of decide to keep it option in there for Redbox, is there? Actually, there is. If you keep the what? game for 30 days, they'll just charge you the, the full amount uh, and, and deduct. Uh, so basically, your rental fees accrue at two dollars per day. But if you hit the full retail price of the game, um, so if you keep the game for thirty days, it's yours. Just keep it. Okay. Now that now this completely jumped up to awesome town. Now I'm excited. Now I totally see the benefit of it. Brilliant. Well, well done, gentlemen. And I think I mean with Redbox for movies. I don't know. I mean, I have some issues with renting movies through Redbox. I don't like this whole like we're not going to include DVD extras on on rentals. For DVDs, yeah. I think that's, that's whack. Not, that's not Redbox's fault. That's I know it's not. But it's weird because Netflix, well, Netflix, it varies. Um, you know, most, but like with TV and stuff like that. But with Redbox, they don't have a lot of TV stuff. So I found myself not really using Redbox. But for games, actually, I think I'm going to use Redbox to get some games from here on out just when I need something quickly and just want to pick it up. And there's enough locations, at least. I mean, in Petaluma, I can think of four places that have a Redbox kiosk. So I'm definitely going to be using that in the future just when there's games I just need to check out quickly and easily. So how long do you think it'll be till Redbox, and maybe they already do in select markets, uh, how long until they actually burn out specific deals, like self-replicating inventory they could have? Oh, that's given a tough one. You know, I think because of the way it works with the publishers, and we talked about this last week in terms of how publishers make their money in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, Nintendo, Sony, uh, Microsoft, they charge per disc replicated. They're not selling these discs at, you know, a raw cost of a dollar a DVD. I mean, they essentially bake in a cost of uh, like four to, I think it's like $6 a unit per game ordered, and you can only get it manufactured through the publisher. So I actually don't think that's going to happen as far right. as uh, console games go. Yeah. No, Just I get that. I, I can totally see where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on to the next story, uh, a little bit more information has come out this week regarding the Wii U and what kind of graphics chip it's going to be uh, inside of it. Turns out it's going to be a uh, last generation Radeon um, graphics chip, and it's more advanced than the PS3 and Xbox 360. What I thought was interesting about it, what immediately jumped out at me in terms of the specs that were released, is that it is capable of displaying up to four standard definition video video streams on the chip. And I know that's part of what we talked about in terms of the Wii U. What we would like to see through these new controllers is more of being able to do multiple screen-based controllers. I just thought it was interesting that the chip is capable of doing up to four streams which means they might have some flexibility as far as that's concerned in the future. Um, Kotaku what? also reports that uh, that Nintendo is looking into the possibility of doing multiple screen-based controllers. I know last week, okay. post-D3, that was one of our big disappointments was the concept that Nintendo might limit it to one screen-based controller and then the rest all on the television. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be a real bummer. Did we ever find out what the physical limitation was going to be on that, whether it was a bandwidth thing or just the fact that they, they said, oh, well, we're not sure we want to. Well, they're that. saying it's a cost issue because, you know, in terms of write, writing the gameplay experience for one screen-based controller, that's going to be shipped in the box. But if you're doing more, you know, who knows how much additional controllers are going to cost. It's going to become very cost prohibitive to do something, you know, that would, for instance, feature four player. Uh, although, you know, I think, though, it's such a powerful experience. I could see devs writing for that. I mean, yeah, I guess it's, for something like yeah. even a Gears of War type experience where you're there with your friends and the two of you side by side. And there's some part of your vision that is shared up ahead. But meanwhile, you have your own uh, reticle to, to fire from. Uh, yeah, I think I think. They've got to do this. I can't imagine that they wouldn't. Now, this is finally a good nod to the hardcore game PCs and uh, or PC style gamers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to think that they're going to follow this through all the way. And in terms of it being cost prohibitive, I mean, it's no more cost prohibitive than people, you know, using uh, four 3DSs and doing four player that way. And oh, sure. publishers right. write for that, you know, support for it. So I, th I think I think we're going to see just 
just my prediction as we head towards 2012 and the launch of the Wii U, my prediction is that even though now Nintendo is focusing on the one screen based controller, my prediction is that they're going to be looking towards two or four player as this comes closer to launch. Cause I think everybody is so in love with that idea. So uh, in the chat room, Easy Smoke was complaining. He was like, last generation Radeon for 2012. But you got to realize that the current batch of both the PS3 and the um, uh, the Xbox 360, Xbox 360 is now, I think, six generations out mm-hmm. of date. That's uh, the the refresh cycle for video cards. You're looking at uh, one per year, at least, sometimes yeah. even more. Uh, and and it, it, this is a significant upgrade. It will be significantly faster from a graphics perspective. However, you know, keep in mind that nowadays our limitation is less often the graphics card and more often the the, the amount of RAM, the, mm-hmm. uh, the 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 main processor as far as keeping track of player positions and ballistics and physics and all those kinds of things. Because they didn't mention anything like a dedicated physics process or anything like that. Well, and they're saying that the the Wii U, uh, the custom core, will support DirectX 10.1, whereas the Xbox 360 can only do DirectX 9. Really? Yes. That's, that's actually way significant because obviously that's a huge financial uh, financial concern for somebody. For example, like Duke Nukem Forever, which we're going to talk about later. You know, they started writing it for PC, but then we're like, well, the money is certainly in the console. And luckily, when you write for DirectX for one, mm-hmm. the bulk of the experience translates right over. So it's easy to recompile it for another. So that's a, that's, that's a really big deal, especially for hardcore games well and i think that you know uh, people in the chat room are saying well you know when um the the next uh xbox is out and i think that's part of the thing i mean xbox successor microsoft hasn't announced a date yet sony hasn't announced a date yet people are speculating maybe next year we'll hear some early announcements but i think it would be kind of a surprise if they were you know going to release either system before 2013 2014 which is i believe what's expected at least as far as the ps3 goes ps3 and xbox yeah yeah next generation think about think about how old the Mm -hmm. xbox 360 will be come 2013 it'll be almost 10 years old is that right no not quite 2005 six yeah so eight years december 2005 so yeah i mean we're talking long cycles but i don't know man i'm i'm still playing games on the 360 and playing games on the ps3 that don't look you know not too shabby ps3 especially ps3 looks fantastic um yeah but it's not like it was back Many, many moons ago, uh, back, you know, I mean, think about 8-bit, 16-bit, 32 Remember when we're talking about I, I, color palettes? Remember we're talking about this system could do 4,096 different colors? Well, and you got to think about <laughs> that it. That was when- once an actual limitation. Colors you know, and 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 these are also very simple numbers. When you're talking about a leap in colors, an order of magnitude from 16 color EGA to 256 color VGA, and then you know resolutions that are order of magnitude superior. Now, uh, so much of the yeah, look at that. We got some fabulous CGA graphics yeah. here that put it all in perspective. When you go from that to photorealism and full motion video, that's something everybody gets. Nowadays, it's a lot more subtle. And it's, uh, you know, it's, and to be honest, we're seeing the exact same thing happen in the handheld market as well. There's this leveling off on cell phones we've had, especially since the introduction of the iPhone, you can hold an iPhone Gen 1 and then hold a, 3, uh, a 3GS and be like, wow, there's a huge difference. You can hold the 3GS and then hold your iPhone 4 and say, wow, there's a huge difference. But even then we're starting to see a leveling off. Whereas just like at some point the you get a good enough on the experience and all of a sudden novelty and gameplay start to trump whereas uh whereas it used to be just hardware well and i think that's part of it also is that we're dealing with 1080p basically in terms of resolution and once you hit 1080p and that's what every hd set supports now 3d not really grabbing people the way that people thought it was going to as far as a gimmick, at least, uh, you know, 3D when television you sales. The way people thought, the, the way, way the, the way the industry had their fingers crossed and hoped yes. and prayed because that would have been the next generation. If 3D TVs had taken the nation by storm, I think we would have seen much more of a push for that. I think I, I think you would have seen that instead of the connect and the move. I think 3D support would have been the big story coming out of E3 oh, last year and this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, had that taken hold. But it, could it clearly happen, has, but it, it, can't it, it could still happen. It no, could. No, I, yeah. I'm, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying that 3D could still happen, but not oh, yeah. the way that they're choosing to implement it now, not with the active shutter technology or any of that ridiculous stuff. Yeah, and so really until we hit 4K screens, until we you know get the next generation of displays, I don't think there's going to be much clamoring for the next jump forward in terms of, of graphics. I mean, it's nice, but 
people are still being able to do a hell of a lot with with the current hardware uh, that exists. And I mean, just again, thinking back to 8-bit, 16-bit palettes, when full motion video, remember when full motion video was a big deal and it was oh, yeah. two, 256 color dithered full motion video? Like, I mean- And plus, how- and plus also like the entire background, all the green screen was static yeah. and it was only the characters were obviously animated. Everything else was totally still. Like, do you remember the, the Sherlock Holmes game for the TurboGrafx-16? Yes. That yes, I do. Hilarious and awesome. Where I remember, it's just like everything's a big book. Oh man, Where, well, this little window right there. I think when we get into doing more retro games on the show each week, I mean, just, just look, I could, I could do, I could do an entire week just devoted to full motion video in, in video games. <laughs> the good and the bad. Yeah, I, 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 we could probably you, do I, a series, a twelve part series on full motion video in games. I definitely, definitely spent a thousand dollars upgrading my PC so I could play the seventh guest. Oh in man, SGA. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, Next story that we have is that this week, Half-Life 3 rumors surfaced and were shot down. Did okay, you, so I heard yeah. I heard rumblings of this, but I don't know what they were. They had to do with somebody leaving Valve or something, and that was an indication of something? Somebody left Valve, and I guess on his resume, he put that he had worked on uh, Half-Life 3, Episode 3. And... Uh, uh- and according to his resume, episode three was put on hold when Valve decided to move away from the episodic model in late 2007, right after episode two's release. Uh, according to the story on Game Informer, he was a technical advisor on a canceled Half-Life title made outside of the company. Uh, uh, his work on Half-Life 3's world programming and the scriptum system uh, is also mentioned in his resume. So, of course, being the people who are so passionate about Half-Life, this even as a hint, just took the internet by storm for a day or so until Valve's Doug Lombardi responded that this rumor uh, is, it basically said this is fiction, aside from the fact that the guy whose resume was posted is a real person. Uh, yes, well, and at least we know that much. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like none of this is... This isn't even anything specific. We all know there's got to be a Half-Life 2 Episode 3. We all know there's going to be a Half-Life 3 at some point. It would be insane for them not to do it. Um, this isn't even really that great of a good rumor. I say... I think people just it. want anything they can get at this point, don't you think? Uh, yes. In fact, <laughs> you know what? I am tempted to actually take out an ad in PC Gamer Magazine that's just a picture of a crowbar with the number 3 on it and, whenever, and, and some website. And when they go there, it'll be a picture of me saying... Hi, I like Half Life, and I'm looking forward to the third one. <laughs> Hi, it's funny That'd people. A- people in the chat room are saying, you know, uh, now we're getting game spoilers from from people's resumes. But I think that, you know, oh, oh, we saw a lot of yeah. that. And again, what we're going to talk about Duke Nukem here in a bit. But but when everybody left 3D Realms, they had to put out their resumes. They had to put out their demo reels. <laughs> and of course, what have they been working on for the last two years? Some people's so- entire career has been Duke Nukem forever. Exactly. And so there's yeah. a lot of Duke Nukem leaks that came out from that. Um, moving on to the next story, this week a little bit a little bit of the turf war that I predicted two weeks ago started started creeping up. Uh when two weeks ago EA announced Origin, their new uh direct download game service, sort of a Steam competitor, uh launched basically uh this week. Crisis 2 uh, was removed from Steam, and the new Alice game, uh, Madness Returns, disappeared from Steam. So people immediately speculated, oh man, EA is making their move. They're going See, this, exclusive. This sounds, this sounds so EA. This is some and I think room. that's Somebody says, well, if, we're, if we have our own thing, why are we using somebody else's? And I story? think that's why people jump to this conclusion to, to make it, and I'm going to go old school reference here, to make it all, you know, Leno versus Arsenio all of a sudden. That, that there's some exclusivity Not even Leno rule. versus Letterman. You yeah. went all the way back to Leno versus Arsenio. Well, that, I've been watching the Larry Sanders show lately. So, you know, my mind's a little back in 92. Yeah, uh, why don't you make it Carson versus Arsenio while yeah. you're at it? <laughs> but in terms of exclusivity, um, so people were speculating because, again, it does sound like a very EA thing to do, which, which is kind of, uh, I guess, a nice non-profane way to say it. That sounds like a very EA thing to do, dude. Well, it's just, and it's so idiotic. It's like, well, that by lo- by that logic, why don't you pull it from GameStop? Because they're competing with your well. well they're not directly competing. They're a totally different sector. Is, you know, here's drive- the thing. It is available. Both games are still available through uh, Amazon, GameStop's Impulse Service, and Gamefly's Direct to Drive. So 
Of course, again, some people think, man, okay. that's EA just taking a shot at Steam. But they're saying that it actually has to do something with uh, Steam's uh, terms of service that somehow conflict with the agreements that they have with these other distribution channels. Yeah, and, and, well, and if you listen to it, like, I'll, I'll read the exact quote because they're very careful about what they say. Mm -hmm. uh, they say... Um Oh, it's unfortunate that Steam has removed Crisis 2 from their service. This was not an EA decision or the result of any action by EA. Steam has imposed a set of business terms for developers hoping to sell content on that service, many of which are not imposed by other online game services. So uh, essentially, they make it sound as though Steam just drop the hammer on them out of nowhere like an vindictive response to them opening origin but i guarantee you it's the kind of thing where they knew going into it what the terms were to be on the steam store and that they're like oh we plan to defy those terms and then steam's like well then we're not going to carry you on the store then and then they're like well steam's apparently a big fat poopy pants and <laughs> you know that's uh yeah it's it's so petty the way and, and of course there are people whose job they are to carefully craft these and, and a lot of this is speculation on my part but um, yeah, I, tell tell me this. Um, hmm. There's no there's no way around it. We're all gonna have to have like three stupid installed programs on our computer now. We're gonna have to have we're gonna have to have Origin installed and Steam and Impulse and you know good old games. All of these things separately. And and because unlike a uh, chat program, there's not gonna be any available API. So there won't be any kind of trillion type one interface to rule them all available to us, is there? No, I, th I think you're exactly right. I think that's what it's going to be, and I don't think there's any way around it until consolidation happens, uh, until, uh, you know, maybe people get bought up. Uh, but I think that if you were just to look at the turf uh, and the turf war that, that maybe is is there there in the in the uh in the not so distant future i think ultimately it's going to come down to steam versus origin just because ea being such a huge company and steam being so established it's going to be like itunes versus amazon you know uh well and and again I, itunes versus amazon i th i think as long as there's two i like there being a coke and pepsi but at yeah. some point you just get annoyed when all of a sudden it becomes so fractious and it's like i do not want to install the activision online store i do not want to also <laughs> Shh, don't give them any ideas man <laughs> I, I, I again but but here's what i'm hoping i'm hoping that steam is uh is an efficient enough model that uh, And first of all, it's a great platform for indie developers. So obviously yeah. a lot of people are happy with Steam. There's a reason it's the number one largest install base. But what I'm hoping is that EA was a special case where they are so giant that they think that they can, you know, by, by screwing over Steam and saving whatever the sliver is by opening their own service – that, that or, you know, two things. First of all, I hope that they're the only ones big enough to try to pull this off. Number two, I hope it fails miserably and that everyone goes back to Steam. And that's just <laughs> me talking only as a selfish gamer who doesn't want to, to install another stupid program. Yeah, no, no, of course. Um, moving on to what else is happening with EA this week. This is, uh, I guess, our hot topic number one. We got to come up with a better name for this segment. Oh, no, yeah. In if, fact, yeah, let us let us declare that'll be the last time we ever use yeah, the word. I, I was writing this out today as I was refining the format, uh, as I do every Friday before these beta shows as I tweak and figure out what's going to be going on. Um, Why don't we call it like, uh, I don't know, the the death rattle or death. Uh, something more metal like, you know, brain bashing subject or uh, uh, I don't know. Get get back to me on this. It's got to be more we gotta, metal. We got to come up with something good. So, well, or just something that, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I was trying to think of like, you know, like, I don't know, uh, discussion topic. Just, I don't know. So it's got to be some cool I'm sure the chat realm, in their infinite wisdom, we can come up with something Death much games. better. Games. Let's try and keep it at least semi-descriptive. Um, yeah. So this week there was some Battlefield 3 pre-order controversy. And uh, Brian, did you pay attention to this story much this week? Uh, you know, I, I did not hear about it at all. And I saw it in the doc. I didn't get a chance to read it before. What's what's the short version of it? Basically, in the UK, there was going to be some exclusive pre-order DLC um, that was going to, you know, offer some very good weapons, some very good enhancements to the game. Um, people were a little nervous about the idea that if they didn't pre-order through this retailer, that they were never going to get to see this DLC. Because let's face it, it sounds kind of like a pretty EA thing to do. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, uh, especially uh, people get really weird about bonuses that you get in game because, yeah. and it's a weird dance because they want to make it a juicy enough morsel that people bother to do the pre ordering, but they don't want to make it in any way uh, negatively affect people who didn't pay early or special and and have them resent the fact that they that they don't have this uh, enhancement to their abilities in the game so as a result you get a lot of hats 
or costumes or I know, mean I stuff. look I and this is part of the reason why I put it in in hot topic <laughs> you know in terms of something we could discuss is a new story and I think this is you know how we'll kind of handle these things that are more discussion oriented um but I mean Long story short, so EA relented and basically because, I mean, like this was all over Reddit. I know you confessed you do not have a Reddit account this week, Brian. I saw that on your Twitter. I I read Reddit. I read Reddit all the time. And uh, I'll tell you that you could not, on the the gaming uh, subreddit, you could not get past a page without three stories about the petition and the outrage over this Battlefield 3 uh, DLC, this pre-order uh, DLC controversy. So essentially EA clarified that ultimately this will be available to all players. It's just that people that get it through this retailer will have first crack at it. It will be a time-based exclusive. Oh my gosh. Let me tell you, dude, if there's anyone that you're going to piss off, don't let it be a bunch of, of uh, people who have a lot of free time on their hands and are passionately awaiting the release of a game. Yeah. And by that, I mean teenagers during the summertime because <laughs> they will do nothing but spend like three weeks at a time stirring up crap on forums trying to take yeah. you down. They don't like the way it's going. You know, and we don't need to get into it all this week because we have so much else to talk about. But I mean, I'm sure you can obviously, from the way we're talking about it, infer what our views are on pre-order DLC and whatnot. I mean, it, it to me, it just seems silly as long as it's a time-based exclusive. That That's what makes it bearable to me. But I just think that it's so it's so ridiculous. The you idea, know, uh, you, know, you know, I actually, I don't, I don't hate it, especially, you know, I'm glad that I got the in-game items that I did for, for mm-hmm. Team Fortress 2 by playing and purchasing, um, you know, Poker Night at the inventory. You know, it's, it's yeah. cosmetic and it's silly and it's fun. That's all, that's all totally fine. But when you get into something that, that. You no, know, it's like missions. I don't, I don't care about different outfits, but like with LA Noir, I mean, there were different missions that you got as pre-order bonuses that I had to wait three weeks to to play until you know they were available for general purchase and they were ones that actually they didn't hugely impact the story but it would have been nicer to play them in that flow i mean and dlc add-ons in general i mean that's something else we could probably complain about for you know an entire series of shows just in terms of the idea of releasing these games that are essentially you know 80 percent, and then they're charging us for you know the additional 20 oh no but again when you do it right i mean first of all whatever it is how you often will- is it done right though I, I don't know how many games has Valve released that have had DLC. <laughs> when when Valve is Valve is the exception, not the rule. You know, but, but even the, even then, you know, some of the DLC that they had, uh, like like what was the DLC? You could get like um some some weird emotes for your robots during the co-op thing. Oh, and that's fine. But I'm talking about like complete different missions or complete different characters or you know, I mean, I'm talking about like fighting games. You know, where it just feels like they're essentially all the things that used to like Mortal Kombat's a great example. All the stuff that used to be cool Easter eggs and unlockables and those codes that you know were so much fun to discover and and just share. Um, I, I think that's nostalgia. That's but now it's a purchase. The now they're just charging us two bucks a character for it. That's lame. Uh, you know, I think that's fine. Uh, you know what? Maybe you should be able to do it either way. Either you can unlock it through gameplay, or it's like you know what? Just just let me let me. Here's two bucks. Let me yeah. play the game. Or Jim the Fly in the chat room says, you know, DLC that's posted on release or shortly after the game comes out. That's what pisses him off. And I agree with that. When day one, it's like, hey, you know this game you just spent sixty dollars on? Spend ten dollars more or five dollars more. You know, it's just it's just such a blatant cash grab. Yes, uh, I agree. They, they, well, you run that problem. You run into the um, uh, the risk of that. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, for most of the games that I play, and I very rarely will do the DLC. I, you know what I liked is I liked the way Dragon Age handled it, where you're at camp and you sort of have the option. You know, this character shows up, you have a discussion, and it's obvious that you have the option to go do this other story. Yeah. Uh, but then it's just like it, it, it very briefly takes you out and you're like, hey, by the way, what you're doing is um, you're signing up for some DLC here. We'll charge you, but don't worry about it. But but again, yeah. I don't mind because I love even back to the days of board games like uh, with, uh, did you ever play the game Talisman? No, no. I didn't. Oh, my gosh. It was like it was like it was like D&D uh, board game, essentially. But I uh, mm-hmm. love Talisman. And then I bought the extan- expanded edition, which made a bunch more characters and made a bunch more encounters. And then uh, then I bought the 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 time uh, what, the Talisman Dungeons, then I bought the, the 
Time Warp one. I mean, there were so many expansions, and I loved each one. And eventually, we would play with some and not with others. But it created this small little nucleus of a game that was already fun and gave it so many awesome twists and nooks and crannies to go into. So, I mean, I'm I'm okay with with the well, charge. I like add-ons. Add-ons, yeah. I don't have a problem with. In fact, I mean, I love stuff like Red Dead Redemption, where they would do you know like the Red Dead Undead add-ons. I like when they release stuff later, and if it's free or they charge, that's cool when it's more like an expansion. I just don't like this idea that we're gonna give you bonus case or bonus uh, maps, you know, right from the get-go. At least take a while and make it more substantial. When it's something like Call of Duty and they release it, you know, and you have like Call of the Dead and it's more substantial like that, I have respect for it. It's just when it's day one, it feels like they're just really just trying to milk the audience. So you think you think you should wait a little while and then go like, hey, you like that? Guess what else we got for you? That kind of thing. I think it should be substantial, first off. And I think that's the, I think it should feel like an add-on. I think I, uh, like a legitimate add-on, I'm talking about like an expansion as opposed to just a day one, here's a way to get $10 more out of you. Yeah, and you know what? I could totally see that. Like there are certain movie experiences where from day one you see the tie-in with McDonald's and you already know that they're setting up for the sequel and that there'll be a video game and that you see when you smell those tie-ins in advance and they don't feel organic, they feel programmed, it, it frustrates you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Um, so, okay, let's, let's move on just before we get completely off the rails on this one. But that's the thing. I feel like there's so many examples and so much we could talk about with it. This will be a topic that is revisited often. I'm, I'm, as long as the industry keeps keeps up this practice, we'll be revisiting it weekly. I'm sure you know. Yeah, look, it's you got to remember. It's like for all for all, as fast as everything moves nowadays, video games is such a young industry. I mean, less than well, thirty years old at this yeah. point. But. For all intents and purposes, um, as far and certainly as far as storytelling, I think we're only like what, like 20, 25 years into storytelling in video games. Um, I, there's gonna be some some hiccups and bumps on the way before we figure out what really works. So I'm not. It's it's hard for me to be too hating. And like we already had the horse armor debacle with Oblivion back <laughs> in the day. And the moment you see DLC, everyone's like horse armor. Remember that? How dumb was that? Ah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I see that. Um, so let's move on to our big game of the week that we didn't think was ever going to happen. We, I mean, we thought this, this game was, was beyond vaporware, which is a uh, Duke Nukem forever finally yeah. shipped last Tuesday. Who's this? We Tonto. I knew, I knew <laughs> it was I yeah, you were a believer all time. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I gonna happen uh yeah i didn't get to play as much of it as i wanted to i actually just uh started this morning so i'm like three maybe four hours into it i'm actually only um why did you finish the game how far did no you get? see you didn't get to play as much as you wanted to i didn't want to play as much as i was able to oh man <laughs> That's that was the problem I had. I was just like, you know, it was kind of that that experience where um, so much time has passed that when I picked it up and started playing it, I was like, you know, and I went into it actually saying like, man, yeah, I, rem I remember, you know, Duke Nukem 3D and I remember having, having kind of an okay time with that. And then, you know, I know there's been a lot of negativity about it, but it's finally out. And I'm really going to embrace it. And then it was sitting in and playing it. I think it was about maybe 15 minutes in where I had that realization like, wait a second, I, I never really liked Duke Nukem that much, and this just really reminds <laughs> me of everything that I disliked about the franchise. It, it felt like just a time capsule of, of, of just just this disinterest that I'd shelved because the story about the game eclipsed the game itself. I mean, don't you really feel like this is a game that perhaps more than any other one in recent memory, I mean, people have been making the comparison like this is the Chinese democracy of video games. It's kind of the thing. By the time it finally came out, it wasn't even a question of am I even still interested? It, it was just, you know, the idea that it's finally here. You know, I was yeah. more ex excited that it actually happened. Kind of like the I Star Wars prequels a little bit, you know? Oh, man. Wow. That's a hell of a thing to do. Uh, compare this to the Star Wars prequel. No, but the oh. idea that you, it, it was an idea once and then it became such an idea. I remember like when you were a kid, people would say for years, and you're like, you know, George Lucas is going to make some more of those movies. You know, there's going to be a whole other trilogy. And people no, and would be like, oh, and then when it finally happened, it was like, oh, man, I'm excited because this thing is finally happening that people have been talking about. And then watching it, it was just kind of like, oh, man, I'm, maybe maybe this wasn't necessary. That was my 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 reaction to Tuko Forever. Maybe this wasn't necessary. Well, and first of all, uh, keep in mind, you could say that now, you know, um, yeah. but but then again, let's say let's say Duke Nukem existed as Duke Nukem 3D and then it yes. came and it went and that was it. Or I think there was a couple of other minor, minor games afterwards, but that was it. And it was dead silent for an entire decade. And then two and then two years ago, they said, guess who's back? I mean, 
then you'd be freaking out. There's no way to to separate the experience of playing the game from the story, the beleaguered story of the creation of of the game. For so many Definitely. reboots, so many so many uh, restarts on franchises. Um, uh, I I'll tell you this much: from where I am right now, uh, it's I am annoyed at what I perceive as. A lot of, and first of all, full full disclosure, my brother worked on the game for two years. Um, he was part of the team that got canned um, uh, at 3D Realms. Uh, and so he was heavily invested in it. And um, uh, I am frustrated with what I perceive to be a lot of media uh, uh, taking easy slam dunks, you know, where they're just like, Oh, well, definitely. And we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, I mean, because that's that's I think its own issue. You know, and we talked about this before on the show in terms of like the negative review is an art form. You know, yes. Um, Jim the Fly in the in the chat realm said something fantastic, which is Duke Nukem Forever was like drinking when you're not 21. It's mythical and wondrous. Then you turn 21 and realize that you're in a bar paying five dollars for a beer and nine dollars for a mixed drink, and go, wow, this isn't as great as I thought. That is absolutely right. And that was the most frustrating thing that I saw on most of the reviewers. And it's like, I thought of that line from the breast breakfast club where the janitor is talking to the douchebag teacher and he's talking about how these kids, they used to come in, blah, blah, blah. There used to be this. And he's like, Hey man, kids haven't changed. You have. And yeah. that's what I want to say to everybody who's got, who's got their gripes for, for Duke Nukem forever. It, you know, and again, it wasn't, um, I, I don't know enough about the writing to say what they did or didn't do, but at people change over time and i think like as now a father there's a lot of the humor of the game that i'm like okay you didn't need it i'm glad my daughter didn't see that but uh but then there's other parts where i'm just like <laughs> yeah that's funny um and i think that's the thing is i don't know though do you, i mean do you ever feel like duke nukem was ever really great as, as a game because duke nukem yes. 3d i felt like it, 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 it was, was shock value it, it was a decent nope, 3d nope, nope. title but you don't think it was just shock value that, that oh, nope. made it Stop. notable. It was successful. It was very, very well beloved because Duke Nukem 3D was the first multiplayer deathmatch game to make it fun and outrageous and silly. It was the first one to create these two part kills where you miniaturize someone and then squish them. It was the first one to uh, to to have these novel gameplay dynamics where you'd set up a bunch of of trip mines and then go over to a console and watch on a security camera until you watch somebody walking around and then you blow them up. I mean, it was um if you liked. Uh, Duke Nukem uh, 3D, you probably loved Rise of the Triad, which I absolutely adored back in those days, in the early Deathmatch days. That's I'm convinced that that's that a lot of the nostalgia we have now, a decade later, what do you remember? You remember the easily quotable things or or the uh, the visuals, the outrageous, you know, giving money to strippers, that kind of thing. But people get confused with the medium and the message. And I think, mm. um, first and foremost, the original Duke 3D was fun to play, and it just happened to have an outrageous over-the-top character. And at some point, people d perceive that, uh, oh, it was great because it was outrageous. The you little know, like bits of interactivity I thought were cool, but there was I thought there was a novelty. But the humor was what seemed to me that everyone stuck upon. Because, I mean, I compare that to like playing like, like Quake 2. You know, I mean, like Quake 2 I, was a game that I really enjoyed playing. Duke Nukem, when you stripped away the I mean, it was just, to me, it was an average first-person shooter. Uh, what Quake Two? No, no, Duke Nukem 3D. Duke Nukem 3D. Well, it, yeah. again, it was it was part of that time. It was it was yeah. slightly behind Doom in the in the release schedule, just before Quake, I believe. Right? Uh, uh, right. I thought it was ninety. I don't know, ninety six, ninety seven. I know. I I think Duke Nukem barely came out before Quake, but I know they were relatively contemporary at the time. And I know from a technical standpoint, Quake was way, you know light years ahead of of Duke 3D in that it was true 3D for the first time. But uh, it uh, but as far again as the fun, it was fun yeah. and it was light and it was bright colors and it was this guy with a red shirt and and it was it was visually appealing and it had uh, you know these ripped off lines from movies that we which love. is weird. I always thought that was weird how they I mean. Uh, I can't think of any other example in gaming or in media where they've been able to just get away with like we're just going to take the best and basically say that it's a parody of, oh, no, of no, no, all no, those no. genres. That's all, it's all that's yeah. uh, video games. Uh, again, you got to realize how yeah. early this this mm. theme is. I remember playing a game called Sentinel Worlds One. They were so excited about it they called it Sentinel Worlds One, anticipating a second one. Uh, all of the characters that you could play. It was obviously a photo of the Terminator. It was obviously yeah, yeah. a photo of Ripley from Aliens. It was obviously well, I mean, even Ellie Noir, like LA Confidential. I mean, definitely it's there's not a lot of originality. But I mean, in terms of the catchphrases and lines, though, I mean, just completely just just outright taking it, you know? 
Oh, and again, it's like uh, Duke's the kind of guy who would watch a movie, be like, hey, "I like that," and then go out and quote it. And uh, again, I don't think that's 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 in, out of out of character. But I I agree. Um, it's interesting to me how many of those lines that uh, that he truly did make his own. Like there, I would bet there are a couple of lines where I bet more people would misattribute it to Duke Nukem than to the movie from which it originally came. But that's but that's always been the case with quotes anyway. They always get misattributed that way. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that, that Duke is... Because when I notice it, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just... It, to me, it, that's what seems lame about it is when it's just a quote that, that just... I, I attribute with something else. I mean, like the line from They Live, like, you know, like the kick ass and chew bubble gum thing, stuff like that. I mean, those lines I love from the original context and it just seems kind of sad when it's all humor based on... Something I, previous. I guarantee you that more people experienced that quote in a Duke Nukem game than did from the movie They Live. You're high. No, come Absolutely. on. They oh, Live. No. They Live is they one of the greatest movies of all time. I, I'm not saying it's not great. It's and it awesome. is beloved. It, that but is I'm, beloved. And that is held up. I, I, how I, many people, how many people have watched that movie? And how many people have played Duke, Duke Nukem and heard him say it five, six, seven, eight, nine times? I don't know. I've, there was probably a good 10 years that you could not flip a channel on on basic cable without hitting they live i mean that, uh, that was everywhere oh, in fact my brother is actually skyping me right now saying the line is backwards and they live <laughs> apparently they fix it around i don't know i i can, can we actually get my brother in here yeah we actually let's do that on the game. for those of you who don't know my brother jay brushwood uh is a 12 year veteran of the video game industry the first triple a title he worked up straight out of he went to full sale uh college college university i don't know uh, but uh, went to uh, he worked on American McGee's Alice. He was on the team that uh, did uh, uh, Wolfenstein for the Xbox Return to Castle Wolfenstein for the Xbox. He did the Doom 3 expansion. He worked very closely with the folks over at id. He spent a couple of years over at um, uh, 3D Realms and he was part of the team that put together the teaser trailer that expo exploded two years ago when everybody thought Duke was dead and gone. He, uh, he and my brother my brother and his team, Three or four people put together this thing. Exploded. Are you on the line there, Jay? I, I think I hear you. Hello. Hey. hey, bro. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you guys? I'm I'm well. So uh, so for those who don't know, uh, what was your job when you were? How long did you work on Duke Nukem? And uh, and uh, and how? And what what did you work on? Uh, well, I got there in May of 2007, and I was there till May of 2009 when we all lost our jobs. And I primarily did character animation, and it was <laughs> it was one of those situations where I was not satisfied with my current job, and so I. I had a buddy that was at 3D Realms, and he's like, you should come on, you should interview at least. And so I went, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll go have lunch with George. And it ended up turning into a, a job interview. And they offered me a job. I'm like, uh, you know, all right, I'm ready to try something new. I'm bored where I'm at. And I got on, and literally the first day I was like, what the heck did I get myself into? Because <laughs> it was like the project was so broken. I mean, just basic like naming conventions and planning and just, it was just like, what a cluster bomb this, you know, the so, whole situation. Uh, okay, so, so when you, now, uh, like you took it because it was an interesting project and you were just like, well, I don't know, sure, Duke Nukem, yeah, why not? Let me go for it. Uh, and so, uh, wh wh where were you before then? You you had just finished, uh, you were over at Nerve Software, right? Yeah, I was at Nerve and we had just finished uh, uh, Quake Wars Enemy Territory. Sorry, Quake Wars Enemy, Enemy Territory. And I forgot to mention, you also worked on Call of Duty Black Ops as well. Uh, but the, uh, so when you came in, everything was broken. And so what, what happened during the two year tenure while you were there? Uh, you felt like everything was scatterbrained. How did the team come together? Because I remember there was a brief while that like you were still drooping on it. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Anna was bouncing a ball and Skype cut out your audio. So <laughs> it, was, it, it sounded like you just got attacked by somebody. So, <laughs> what, I was, what I was asking is there was a brief while when it sounded like like the team really had come together and you guys were grooving on it. Like how did how did all of a sudden the three realms thing break down? Like uh, I mean, there was a brief six month period when like every time I talked to you about the product project, you were so excited. Uh, and then all of a sudden just snap like, oh, by the way, we're all fired. Well, I'll tell you, the, the game changer that happened is is we were all doing our stuff and we were trying and trying and trying. But the big thing was we were 
we were fighting George, you know, because George would be like, you're not going to redo this level. And it's like, well, it would be quicker for us to redo the level than to retool it. It was like, I don't care. We're not going to throw away work. And it's <laughs> got to be very, very frustrating. And what ended up changing the game was when Brian Hook came on. And for those, for those of you who don't know, Brian Hook was a programmer in, went out to Sony. Hands hey. down, one of the greatest guys I know. Extremely smart, great programmer. And he wanted to try his hand at, at being a producer. And so... George convinced him to come out and he was going through a change in his life. I think he was going through a divorce at the time. And so he came on and he was basically the only person that could tell George no and just be like, you know, shut up, you're wrong. We're not doing it that way. And so and so uh, when he came on, Brian Hook really went to bat for us and he just started greasing the wheels of this machine and we were just cranking towards the end. And you know, when we and Brian did everything he could to try to save the project, like they met with several different companies to try to sell the IP or try to sell the studio to like, you know, Epic or id or somebody just trying to make trying not to have everybody lose their job at the last minute. And basically at the end, I mean, George, I mean, he spent so much of his personal fortune on it. It's a. Uh, well, and that's yeah. that's what uh, uh, you remember. There was that there was that Wired article that talked about like it was it was almost as though what what killed it as far as being a 3D realms property was was not that nobody cared enough is that everybody or at least George cared so much that he couldn't compromise on anything he couldn't stick to a deadline and that uh, ultimately that's what that's what got the project to run out of money and that's what the game feels like I mean playing it it feels like everything was left in because I mean because if it existed it's it's in there it doesn't feel like a seamless coherent Right. And, and that was, a, you know, I mean, that was a big problem. I mean, and I mean, I fundamentally disagreed with how the game opened. Uh, well, not like the opening in terms of you playing your own game. I thought that was kind of clever. Um, yeah. Well, but and after I, that, though, that's where for me where it started to go downhill, honestly. Like in the, when when it's you playing your own game, that part was okay. But after that, when you're immediately trying to navigate through exactly. it, it just it's such a stall for me. Yeah, map is it's map two. It's a, it's when you know yeah. a whole attack happens, and you're like, wait, so there's an alien invasion, and I'm Duke, and, and I don't I'm have a gun. Driving this yeah. RC car in order yeah. to get a energy cell, and I mean, you know. Believe me, we were there and we were all like, dude, this is crap. Yeah. You know, we need to rewrite this. But I mean, you know, it's kind of this like, I mean, I wouldn't say that they're, you know, they're, your, com your comparison was apt. I mean, uh, very much so. There was a lot of, uh, I would say, George Lucas prequel moments where yeah. basically everybody in the room is just like, you're really Jar Jar, you know, we're really <laughs> doing this. And, I mean, and, you know, I mean, there were some moments like that, you know, yeah. but I mean, George, bless his heart. He's a really good friend of mine. And, I, you know, I love him to death, but I'll tell you this, the whole company goes out to watch the, the, the new Indiana Jones. Okay. We all coming out saying it was crap. It sucked. And George was like, Oh no! I thought it was pretty good, and I, we're just oh. like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> like, well, and sometimes one person's taste can really dictate. I mean, one of the one of the emails we got, we got a lot of listener emails about the game, and I mean, R Sharp in Canada, you know, said straight up, I mean, the gameplay feels like it's directly from the mid 1990s. The graphics seem to be taken from the mid 2000s, and the humor reminds me too much of high school, and not in a good way. We've all moved on in gaming in every aspect. And according to what you're saying, I mean, it's, you get a project head that that hasn't moved on and is stuck. In, in you know in in that mindset, and it seems like that's what dictated a lot of the game. So uh, yeah. Jay, one of one mm -hmm. of the things that I remember the idea kicking around like what wasn't one of the ideas at some point that that the the video game I like the I'm with you I like the idea of him playing his own video game at the beginning, but I would have loved it if the game started where it's like Duke Nukem Forever, and it's just like an obviously an engine eight years out of date and then you play the whole first level like get out of town this is really like they intentionally made it crappy to play so and then it backs out and it turns out that you're playing the video game was that ever on the table did you guys talk about that you know so many things was were sparked around i mean we would we would talk at stuff during lunch and come up with these great ideas but you know ultimately it came down to that we we didn't really have time to like institute our own ideas because we're just scrambling. I mean, when I first got there, it just felt like we were 
we were spinning our wheels and not going anywhere. And we we're kind of started to make move. And, and, you know, that Christmas when we made the trailer, um, you know, uh, we originally did that just as a secret for George, like just to <laughs> like be like, dude, look how cool it can be, you know? And like, you know, and, and it's like, uh, and we did it for the company Christmas party. And, you know, uh, my buddy Jaron had uh, contacted John St. John and he made a whole speech to the team to get them all kind of, you know, excited about the, you know, 2009 being a, or 2008 being a, an awesome year. And uh, or was it was I don't know. When did it come out? I guess uh, 2008. Yeah, yeah, it trailer, was, it was yeah, yeah. Because it was just after uh, I know I know Scam School had launched by then. So yeah, I think and, and no, we were here. We were here in the new house. So it would have been two thousand. Oh wait, two thousand seven. Yeah, wow. I guess. Yeah, that uh, that Christmas we released it, and so it was like, you know, and it was just really inspiring. And you know, Brian Hook came on in February of that year, and just things really started to really groove and. Uh, it's just a tragedy because, um, you know, given, you know, given the freedom, if George had just been a little less controlling, I think it could have been like, like, had just like gone away for two weeks and say, like, you guys come up with some cool stuff and let me see it. Because, because uh, George is a very good BS filter. Like he can, he could sit down and look at something and, you know, recognize what's good and what's bad. He doesn't know the process of why it's good or why it's bad. You know, whereas a lot of he's us a, like, well, and a guy. Hmm? he's, he's it from the gut kind of guy. Like his gut tells him, he's like, and once his gut tells him that's the way he's going to go. Exactly. And so, uh, it, you know, you can imagine it is rather difficult to, uh, it, because like, like he would say stuff like, uh, you know, Duke isn't a parody. He's, he's a serious dude. And you're like, <laughs> And you're like, what? It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, and that—that's—that was uh, wasn't at some point uh, there, and and I think this is uh, this is out there, but like, wasn't at some point Yahtzee Croshaw interviewed about possibly writing the story? And Yahtzee Croshaw loved the original, the original Duke Nukem. This is the guy who does the the zero punctuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reboots. But yeah. uh, and but actually, that actually, uh, that was one thing that Brian Hook immediately he was like, you know, he was like. One of his first things was like, I want to fly Yahtzee up here and have him look at the game and try to come up with a cool story for us. And, you know, my buddy Chris Cummings, who is a, a lead designer, uh, and they had several different peep writers send in samples of stuff. And Yahtzee's was by far just the most outrageous and funny, and they loved it. But George was like, I don't know, it's kind of too far out there. And it's, for it's too far out there. For Duke. Did he actually say things like, I don't think Duke would actually say that. I don't think Duke would do that. I know the man. He would he would say stuff like that. Yeah, man, that's weird. so that it's it's like the Michael Scott of game development. It just sounds <laughs> like, uh, which I mean, it's funny. And it, what's interesting, I mean, one of uh, our listeners and uh, Paul Warner sent in a comment saying that uh, you know he really wanted to like the game, being a big fan of the first, and he wishes that the developer would have taken the extra time and done it right. So it's almost interesting, though. It sounds like almost an instance well, of, of too much time or maybe, you know, just not throwing it out and uh, starting from scratch maybe would have been a better approach. Well, it basically it came down. I mean, because basically the game was in its fourth iteration. Yeah, it's fourth redo, so to speak, as much as a redo can be maintaining all the old parts that you as a developer want to throw out, but you're forced to keep. Uh, uh, well, especially so, in, even some of the writing and the humor where it's just like uh, you know, at some point the jokes have just gone too stale well a lot of that stuff really didn't start coming in there until the end and really? a lot of that is is what Triptych and Gearbox put in there um, you know at the time when we were working on it we were just trying to make a fun game you know and uh, and we are like, oh, well, you know, and they had, you know, they had a broad idea of what was going to happen where. And we we're basically going to have, you know, and, and George, you know, uh, he cared so much about the game and he kept it such a guarded secret. Like he didn't realize how much game he was sitting on because he wouldn't let people play test it. And so, like, he would sit down and he, he knows the levels and he knows where everything is. And he would blow through a level and be like, well, this is 10 minutes of gameplay. And it's like. Well, when we actually convinced them that we can focus group people, uh, we would find out it's 
35 minutes of gameplay because wow. they're figuring stuff out. And it's like, you know, we really got to have testers on this. And, and so, I mean, that's why basically when we all lost our job and the triptych guys set their thing up, they basically more or less uh, took basically half the game and uh, chopped it in half and wrote around the levels to try, to try and make it happen. And, and that's the thing, it feels I mean, really stitched together. I mean, hearing you say this, this, is, this was a lot of my reaction from playing it, it just felt really stitched together and not like just a cohesive flow to the story. Yeah, and you know, a lot of that, I mean, because eventually it, it just became a situation with DNF that you just need to get it out there. You need to tear that bandaid off and move on, you know, because you're going to have people that hate it, love it. You're going to get railed by the media no matter what you're going to get you're going to get your butt chewed up yeah. and so um and uh, specifically, now, uh, obviously, one of the things we, we should make clear is, is you know, we'll never know what the game would have been if 3D Realms had had finished it. Although it did sound like you guys were, you were coming together and stuff was on track. You you guys thought that you had less than a year until release by the time you guys got canned, right? Yeah, I mean, it was going to come out that that Christmas of yeah. 2009. Yeah. But then the money ran out, and so you guys get fired. Everybody goes their own way. You figure that's the end of it. Uh, but then all of a sudden, you start hearing that Gearbox is picking up the pieces, and we got no, them. No, I, I knew. I knew from the beginning. I mean, I was approached by the Triptych guys, and I'm just like, you know, what? I'd love to. I mean, these guys are awesome. They went seven months without pay. Um, wow. I, I was like, I can't do it. I need health insurance. You know, I'm I'm bouncing. Well, that's right, because there was there was a secret like skeleton crew of people who kept working on it between the two announcements, right? So when the whole world thought the project was dead, there was a group of hardcores that were sticking through it to the end. But yeah, the the guys that formed Triptych Games, I mean, they basically made DNF ship. I mean, yeah. Gearbox Gearbox, you know, basically uh more or less the Triptych guys completed the game. Um, and once the game was more or less completed, uh, 3D Realms sold the IP to Gearbox, and then Gearbox, you know, really kind of brought it, polished it as much as they could, you know. But that's from my understanding. That's how everything went down. And so, was there a? Um I mean, it has to be a bizarre maelstrom of emotions for you as the game comes out. Because first of all, you have the fact that you poured two years of your life into it. The fact that whatever it is that came out wasn't had was so filled with compromises and things that you didn't want. Um, there, you're also getting this what I think is almost a, a perverse media feeding feeding frenzy on the game. Where um, uh, and I watched that whole. There was a 30 minute review that you had. That you had tweeted out saying that you thought was a very even-handed representation. Yeah. What were the high points? It was points? by the, this guy, uh, DSP. Uh, never heard of him, but it kind of made the rounds amongst the three realms guys because it all we all kind of related to it. Because this guy was like, you know, it getting a three from IGN is just ridiculous. It's unprofessional. I mean, there there are worse games than than DNF. You may no, not that's like true. It. I mean, the, yes, it's not the worst game I've ever played. I mean, it, it does it does work. It is a functional game. I think it's a just functional the game has a beginning, a middle and an end. It may not be your cup of tea and it may not be the 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 cutting edge of of graphics, you know, for and it may be a little bit hodgepodge stick together, but to give it the kind of rating that you would usually give a piece of shovelware that comes out with a with a yeah. movie in well, uh, I although think it's just addictive. I, I don't know. I mean, like, for me, it just felt like I, I couldn't really get into the flow of it. The humor, and I and I like a lot of over-the-top uh, crude humor. I mean, I've, I like to think of myself as someone with a wide spectrum of things I find funny. Something about it, I just didn't find funny, you know? I mean, just, I don't know why. I mean, some things are just hit or miss that way that, that well, just don't it, speak to me. Uh, there's there's offensive jokes and then there's how you tell the defensive yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's well, like uh, sometimes some people don't tell this. jokes, people don't. What's that, Jay? I'll tell you guys this. I I haven't played the game. I mean, yeah. I, not to sound bitter at all, but I'm not gonna pay money. Like I'm hoping I'll get a Steam code in six months, maybe. <laughs> like well, it's got yeah. No, yeah. I could totally well, understand. Somebody, like, somebody or give, give, or or, give you, or, or you can go to like, Redbox for two dollars, as we discussed earlier. Right. Redbox <laughs> is <laughs> renting Duke Nukem forever. Two dollars, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, two dollars a day. Yeah, two dollars a day. Uh, 
Now, what one of the things that now I I did want to ask you this: mm -hmm. Did you play it on console, Glenn, or did you play it on the PC? I played both. I played it uh, on the 360, and then I played it through Steam. Um, I played multiplayer more on the PC. I played the single player more on the console, and. It, I just couldn't get into it, you know? I couldn't get into either. When, I mean, okay, when I played the single player, I was just like, the, that whole first sequence was so tedious for me, or the not the first sequence, the, the map two you were talking about, that was so tedious for me, and then I switched off playing it with my brother, um, just various segments. But on the multiplayer, what I didn't like about it is the multiplayer, I felt like I was playing, uh, like, I was, like I was playing a game from, from 12 years ago. That, that's really how the multiplayer experience felt to me exactly. Like I yeah. was playing, you know. When, when when I was working there, we had very rudimentary multiplayer working. Yeah. Um, so uh, I I know uh, the Triptych guys and Gearbox did a lot of work on on the multiplayer stuff and getting it working on 360 and getting it working on PS3 uh, because it was it was barely even running on 360 when we got shut down. Mm. And wow. and Triptych has one programmer, and you know they had to like. I guess do a lot of outsourcing. I know um, some Vancouver studio helped out. I forgot. The anyway. multiplayer, I mean, I, you know, th this is actually, I think, the testament to the multiplayer. I, I think that right now I would have a better time playing like the Action Quake mod for Quake than I did with the Duke Nukem Forever multiplayer. It felt like a poor version of that to me. That's what the multiplayer experience felt like, at least. You know? I can so see that. I mean, it definitely, I mean, when I was playing it, it felt very old school and yeah. you know i mean nowadays most multiplayer games it's like team based you know you've got all sorts of mods Object to like based. tweak your your uh weapons it you actually know, felt and, a lot like action quake now that i'm thinking about it which i know is kind of a dated reference for people that didn't play action quake was, was essentially a mod for i think it was the original quake that or maybe it was quake 2 but it gave you um essentially a lot of action movie stereotypes um, in terms of your weaponry, your locations, uh, your power-ups, and things like that. And that's really what the Duke multiplayer felt like to me, at least. So uh, from the chat room, there's somebody who posts it over and over and over again. And I know the answer to this, but I want to kick it over so you can finally, once and for all, uh, put this to rest. Uh, <laughs> Scam School Brian, are the rumors true about 3D Realms getting caught up in World of Warcraft, hence delaying the game? Jay, <laughs> would you like to respond on that? Uh, well, when I was there, that was not the case. Uh, oh, I had heard, heard from some it. of the old timers that there were people that worked there and would just show up and play WoW. And, you know, George is such a nice guy. I mean, he has the hardest time firing people. And, you know, he, you know, he's a big teddy bear, you know. So, you know, it, it kind of it just took a while for him to kind of realize that they they weren't making any progress. And for the longest time, he wouldn't pay for senior people. I remember a lot of the people that were originally part of the team uh, were making entry level pay and being promised future royalties that, you know, <laughs> obviously they never got. Yeah, right. Um, right. Yeah. And I mean, I know like, uh, you know, some people. Had, has been there for seven years. I mean, you know, I mean, Alan Blum was there, you know, for the original Duke Nukem release. Duke won. I mean, he co-created co created Duke, you know, and then eventually sold the IP to 3D Realms. And, uh, I mean, he stuck around. I mean, 12 years, whatever. It took 14 years <laughs> to wow. make it. <laughs> now, what's interesting is uh, this actually uh, interesting theory posed uh, by uh, someone from the chat realm, uh, Driosynth, that sent in a very well-written uh, email talking about uh, what Brian had posed last week, the question of why is Duke Nukem now a joke while Serious Sam is still considered relevant when the two games almost have the same synopsis and mechanics. And he has a theory, I mean, aside from Duke's delay, is that one, uh, Duke changed its core mechanics when it put in a regenerative health system and set a fixed number of guns the player could carry, which makes the game feel more like a bad Halo clone than a 90s shooter. But number two, and this is the part that I think is, is the most insightful, is that uh, for lack of a better word, uh, Duke wants us to take him seriously, whereas uh, Sam doesn't. Both games ooze the machismo that was prevalent in the 90s, but the difference was Sam always knew it was a joke. Serious Sam was inherently a parody of all that Duke was. It's similar to how Weird Al has continued to be relevant when the music he aped has long since become tacky. And I think wow. that's kind of an interesting way to look at it because with Duke, it, it 
does it didn't feel like a parody to me. You know, it felt it felt like a serious attempt at this bad humor. Is with Sir, with Serious Sam or a game that's more uh, a parody, sort of like Bulletstorm or or, uh, or the like. I think that when there's a certain level of over the topness in the approach, I think it could still be relevant. But when it, it did, it did feel to me sort of like like Motley Crue putting out a new album, you know, and just not changing anything. Yeah, I, yeah, well, I could totally see that. Um, I and that was part of the problem. Like I said, is you know a lot of us who grew up playing the original Duke Nukem have, uh, you know, it's like uh, George never got that experience because he created it, you know, so he never got this kind of like, oh, this is what I loved about it type of thing. And yeah. the same thing with uh, George Lucas, you know, with in terms of Star Wars. I mean, you know, the more he, uh, so, I mean, it's it's just unfortunate. And just to but, clarify, the other know, George I'm, I'm Will happy, yeah. I am so happy that it's, sh it's shipped, and I have nothing but good wishes for people at Triptych, 3D Realms, and Gearbox. I wish them all the best in their future Duke endeavors. Well, and just to clarify, because I know we're tossing around uh, references to George Lucas as well as George Broussard, who, uh, who obviously who you worked for, the game producer and designer, who was one of the creators of the Duke Nukem series, just for anyone that's having a little bit of trouble keeping up with everything that we're talking about. It's all about George. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, all about, it's all about the Georges is what it is. Yeah. Uh, okay, w w one last thing, Jay. Um, uh, there was some, somebody sent me a, a tweet Saying, "OMG, Brian Brushwood is in uh, uh, is in Duke Nukem Forever," and I'm going to see if I can dig up the picture right here really quick. But when I uh, when I looked at it, there's a poster in the game that is so obviously Brian Brushwood. It's got it's, it looks just like me. He's got the exact same hair hairstyle um, and everything. And then uh, I, then I called Jay. I'm so blown away by this that I'm like, "What is going on?" And I called Jay. And Jay's like, "Oh, oh no, no. There's just a guy at work who." Happens to look exactly like you and have the exact same hairstyle. Well, and I, I don't, you know, Brad. I can't believe you met him. We always <laughs> joked about he was your doppelganger, and we called him Sonic. You know, because well, his hair was spiked like don't... Sonic. You know. Well, okay, but 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 for that brief moment, like I don't blame anybody for thinking I'm gonna actually blow it up your big here, so you can actually see. But you're right, uh, and uh, uh, now that you mentioned, I do remember it. But seriously. Tell me that doesn't look exactly like, like this guy looks exactly, <laughs> that's, that's, look. What, what's his name, by the way? Andrew Kirshner. Andrew Kirshner. That is Andrew Kirshner. That's not Brian Brushwood. So let's that just, is. let's just clear the air on that right now. <laughs> I, I just you know, tell people it's I you, wish, Brian. I, yeah, wish, you know, I, I wish, wish it did uh, get snuck in i wish that was you um and i even asked them at the release party if there was if you're like i was like my brother's curious is there any way that there's anything related and it's like nope <laughs> oh, <boo. laughs> so brushwood snuck into video games there's a there's a weapon you said you you named a weapon after part of my social security number in uh <laughs> Right, I or do did, uh, do three resurrection. I've got the uh, uh, part of your social security number in there. <laughs> Let's not say. So, if you what? want to steal Brian's identity, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. So, what, awesome. what are you working on now, Jay? Uh, well, I am at Terminal Reality doing contract work, and oh, cool. they're they're doing the uh, Star Wars Connect. So. Oh. It's actually pretty interesting how the how you break up animations for the Connect. So, technically. It's a lot of challenges on that end, and uh, hey, it's Star Wars, so yeah, from one George to another, right? That's yeah. Right. It's, it's always with the Georges with you, Jay. <laughs> oh no! Well, thanks so much for yeah, coming thank in, you. giving some inside sauce on that. It's it's been so fascinating for me to watch you go to 3D Realms to be part of, caught up in the enthusiasm, and to to see everything break down, and to see this phoenix rise from the ashes, and then to see people fling, fling poo at the phoenix who's trying to rise. From <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm getting all sides of this thing. <laughs> no, very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, right. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have come on, uh, you know, anytime. Awesome. We'll have you on again, man. Absolutely. Right, Thank you so much. All so right. Take care. There you have it. That's that's a bit of insight because it does seem this week doesn't it seem Brian like like there's been a lack of of uh, commentary from people that have actually worked on the game. 
Yeah, people who actually know. And, you know, not, not, none of it's really earth shattering. A lot of it you can imagine, but uh, but it's fascinating. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you so much to my brother for coming on. I'm sorry Definitely. that we're going long on the episode as a result, but this is so fascinating to me to, to be able to give kind of the insider perspective of how this, this weird Franken game has been cobbled together from pieces over the last decade. Well, and this brings us to our second hot topic, uh, which... Uh, uh, Damien Demock uh, suggested that, that we call the hot topics the lava level. <laughs> the lava level. The lava, this is our second lava level of yeah, the show. Call it hot slag. Do you remember <laughs> uh, in Doom or in Quake? You know, <laughs> hot slag means something entirely different in the UK, Brian. I'm just oh. saying for our British listeners, that might. It's complicated that, sex move, that, isn't it? Well, no, it just it might cross a line. Or it makes me think of the aliens in uh, Alien Nation. Because was it was <laughs> their derogatory term was slag. Um, yes, n never call your wife a hot slag, Brian. That's just, just a <laughs> okay, piece of advice. Because if she ever looks up what that means. It's done. It's going to be done. go time. Um, but our, our lava level, uh, which a little, doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but I like it in theory, uh, is the Duke Nukem Forever review public relations controversy, which is that essentially, as, as I'm sure many of you followed, the, the reviews uh, for Duke Nukem Forever have not been kind. And uh, many reviewers, and we've talked about this in previous weeks, in terms of there's sort of this tendency when writing a negative review to almost use the review itself as as uh, as an you know a humor piece, uh, as, as something that is entertaining, even if the game is not. That the way you're going to thrash uh, the game, uh, to thrash and trash it, is essentially going to be how you're going to get your amusement, since the game didn't really do it for you. So what happened is a lot of these reviews started hitting, and then uh, Jim Redner, uh, the uh, founder, and uh, I guess basically who is the Redner Group, which was doing the public relations for 2K Games, basically started tweeting after these reviews started being published Tuesday, uh, and he basically tweeted out a, a tweet that said, uh, too many went too far with the reviews. We're reviewing who gets games next time and who doesn't based on today's Venom, essentially saying that in the future he was going to deny review copies of 2K Games releases uh, to people that had thrashed, uh, that he felt had, uh, you know... Uh, gone over the top essentially with their nasty reviews. I will say reviews. this is a mistake for them to do. It's um, uh, you can't get. I understand the impulse to want to decide who can and can't get access yeah. to the game because you're worried about what they're going to say about it. But I got to admit that this will only this will only bite them in the ass in well, future says It will only make people more skeptical. Uh, I felt like I was predisposed to want to love the Duke experience. We were very excited about it at E3, but the way we were handled and manipulated and told what we could not couldn't do, you yeah. can look at it, but don't zoom in and nobody comment on anything. Don't, no, you know, no. we don't want to hear you talk or whatever. That only serves to suddenly twist me against you now, and be like, you know what, you guys are Full disclosure eight. though, full disclosure, I emailed Jim Redner, uh, this week, Monday, saying, hey, we want to talk about Duke Nukem Forever. Uh, can you send me a copy? And he wasn't able to send me an actual physical copy. He sent me a Steam code, uh, which is how I got my PC version of the game. And then uh, my brother had bought the console version. So I, I did get a free PC version of the game for review. And uh, so regardless of whatever weird hoops we had to jump through at E3, I mean, he did send me a review copy um, of the game. Now, however... Of course, uh, Jim Renner tweeted this Tuesday, and it immediately bit him in the ass uh, because I think it was Wednesday that 2K Games announced that we have dropped the Redner Group as our public relations firm, uh, the public relations firm being the group that deals interfaces between the company uh, and the media. Uh, 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 oh. Yeah, so this That's was immediate, hilarious. immediate backlash. And, of course, Jim Renner deleted the tweet that he posted, and he actually gave an interesting review to blogcritics.org. Uh, I mean, if you're interested in the inside baseball of uh, video games and how this weird delicate balance works between the media and uh, review publica you know, publications, outlets such as ourself, how it all works. I mean, it's an interesting review, and I feel bad for the guy because, I mean, he essentially says that, you know, it's a small agency. It's essentially him working out of, like, his apartment, but he's been in the business for a long time. I mean, I, look, I've I'm sorry. It's, it's, yeah. Look, if, if what you do is proclaim to be yeah. an expert in shaping public opinion and you do <laughs> something like that, that instantly gets a major backlash. Oh, definitely. I'm sorry. Definitely. You, you but you, basically, you his excuse was that it was dumb. He should have handled it better. The 2K games reacted as they should have by, by you know, uh, no longer requiring his services. But essentially saying that he felt so invested in the game and acted it out of emotion with that tweet. Now, here's the thing about this, though, Brian. It's not that what he said 
is, you know, I mean, we can look at the stupidity of it, the controversy of it, and the fact that 2K Games reacted accordingly by dropping him as their PR guy. But the bigger issue is that this sort of thing, in my 20-plus years now of covering video games professionally, this sort of thing happens all the time. It is just not normally spoken publicly. Um, I could think yes. of many instances where if you trash a game or you give coverage that people deem sometimes sometimes unfair or sometimes just flat-out negative, you find that you know, you're not getting invited to the press junkets. Uh, you're not, in some cases, not getting games at all. In some cases, you're oh, not getting your uh, yeah, emails and, and returned. There's a reason that Walt Mossberg keeps getting front row seats to all of the <laughs> Apple keynotes. I mean, look, there, there's no doubt about it, but but you're right. Thanks to Twitter, uh, it's becoming more transparent. And I got to tell you, there, there are people, and understandably, who are horrified by the idea of a more transparent world. And then there's other people who are like, well, that's, that's where we're headed. So it's like, let's let's start owning our failures you know, now. And I mean, that goes goes for everyone so on all sides. I feel bad for the guy. I mean, just just like uh, as a person, I mean, he just tweeted something that that was stupid, but it was based on his involvement, what he felt was his attachment to the game. And he, he was personally hurt by it. And we talked about, actually, you know, funny enough, and this might actually have part to do with it, wasn't it 2K Games a few episodes ago we were talking about where some of their employees essentially uh, found that a reviewer that, that had trashed one of their games had a novel available on Amazon. So the 2K Games developers were, were like trashing the, the reviewer's novel essentially so it's kind of funny that, that this cake company... story oh my god yeah that's, that's maybe that's right. why maybe that's why they just missed the redner group uh over this because they've already had a little scrape with seeming yeah. a little too uh you know sensitive in terms of uh, what, man, it's like you um uh and, and and it's kind of unfair it's it's uh the internet gets nuance um and they get uh now, now keep in mind there's a number of things that the internet the internet hordes have swelled in rejection of something, and it turned out to be totally unfair because they were working on bad intel. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, for example, the Lady Gaga uh, thing with with Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but like they understand they understand subtlety when it comes to those things for sure. Yeah. I mean, the th other thing I think is interesting in this in this interview that uh, Jim Redner gave gave to blog critics is that he's essentially also saying that when deciding to rescind view, review copies of the game, not only does uh, previous coverage influences his decision in terms of previous reviews and whether he thinks the outlet is fair or not, but it's also influences his decision before if a company has done pre-release coverage on a game. So essentially uh, rewarding people who have helped contribute to the hype of a game, rewarding them with review copies. I mean, it's interesting to me, and this is one of those weird things where the landscape has changed a little bit now, and I think uh, companies are more selective than they were five or six years ago. I mean, I, you know, I've been very fortunate that, you know, when I started in, in the 90s, I started writing for, you know, the Petaluma paper in uh, the 1990s, and like 1990, for a year before I wrote for the San Francisco Examiner, I was still getting games from every major publisher when I was writing for a paper with a circulation of like 10,000 people. But then when I wrote for the Examiner and I worked at GameSpot Game Center, I mean, there was probably a good 14 year run there where, you know, I never had a problem getting games. Now it's a little more selective. I think they are because there are so many different outlets competing for this free product, essentially. Yeah, no, well, and, and you got, everyone's got a blog and they want something for exactly. free. Exactly. Now, real quick, we got to do an instant retraction. Somebody yeah. in the chat room, Web81 said it was high voltage. Oh, it was high voltage. That, Aren't they published by 2K Games? I, I don't know. I mean, it could very well be one or the other. That's, you know, okay. how they, it's all, it's so difficult to remember, uh, you know, who is a publisher. It's and true. Who, yeah. You know, who's a publisher and who actually made oh, the game. Oh, it's Sega. High Voltage is Sega. Okay, okay, okay. That's with my confusion because of 2K Games and the previous uh, relationship. So, yes. So, that's that's another example that still stands as there has been a little bit of, of retaliation from uh and i think you're right that it, part of it's the internet just in general and the fact that you have developers that are online that are there and i mean they're going to have a reaction you know they found uh they, they take it personally when people don't like their games yep 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 uh hey man you want to get retro yes let's get retro so i was thinking about this game this week our retro game this week is conan hall of volta which was originally available, at least I knew it, on the Apple IIe, which I believe yes. was what no, it was originally no. developed for. You know, in fact, I think this was the first game I ever got pirated, now that I think uh, about oh it. Oh, my gosh. Look, the early days, I'm not going to lie. It's it, it. My recovery from piracy has been a 20-year endeavor. It, it took... <laughs> The final nail in the coffin was Steam. But when you're in third grade and you Somebody have... Somebody gives you a disc? 
you've got older friends who just hand you stuff and it's magic and you're like, all games and are you're just free. like, copy A colon, B colon, what? Exactly. Yeah. It takes a long time to get past it. Wow, I don't remember it looking this bad, but it's... Oh, <laughs> but I man. So I was, the reason I was thinking of this game for our retro game this week is that I was thinking about the original Duke Nukem, which, remember, was a shareware title and a side-scroller, and I was thinking about Commander Keen and sort yeah. of the Apogee catalog. And I remember when Leo and I used to do on computers back in the day, that was always one of those recommendations, you know, for PC gamers, because back then it was like, hey, this, these are shareware titles that will give you a Nintendo-style experience on your PC. And I was thinking to myself, what was the first game I remember, the first PC game I remember that really gave you a console-style experience? And so you, this, you had an Apple IIe back then. I had an day. Apple IIe back uh, when this first came out, and this was what I first remembered as the first console-style game, because I mean, obviously I remember games like Zork or even uh, Police Quest, which we covered in weeks past, but this was the first, you know, platform-style game, uh, real arcade-style game that I remember playing on my Apple IIe. Well, I'll tell you, there's a, there are two other games that pop into my mind the moment I see this. I remember playing the port of Donkey Kong, which was really rather good. Yeah. Uh, I also remember... Oh, that guy sucks at this game. Uh, I, also <laughs> I still remember, don't think I've ever beat this game, by the way. Uh, no, I, I think I remember maybe the first two or three levels here, and that's it. Uh, I also remember, uh, like, Minor 2049er. Yeah, uh, which is, yeah. that's still one of the hardest games. I, I don't think I ever got past level 10 on that. I had my Atari 400 and, and 800 back in the day. And then what was it called? The one I played the most, though, was, uh, it was this game, and it was Hard Hat Harry. Is that what it is? Did you ever that play that? That sounds vaguely familiar, yeah. Where it's like you had to run away from OSHA representatives. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, like what's funny is I didn't get any of the politics at the time, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, man, uh, I think this right here may be about as far as I ever got in this game. Yeah. Uh, and I downloaded uh, a version of this with an Apple IIe emulator like a year or two ago and played it on my laptop and uh, still wasn't able to get but I, about this point was about the first guy because you only got like 10 swords that you could throw. You had a limited yeah. amount of swords. I mean, surprisingly challenging game. What's funny is that I, I assume that this is all shot on an emulator, but it's so funny to watch how herky-jerky it gets even in an emulator. But I remember the play control and this feeling smooth and console-like using just arrow That's keys. That's what's blowing me away because it's like, my man, does does memory ever sweeten the, the awesomeness of things like this? Dude, because when I, I played on an emulator, it still felt smooth with arrow keys and, and a space bar, you know? Yeah. No, that's, uh, uh, man, uh, all of a sudden I want to go back and play all my old Apple IIe games. I want to play Captain yeah. Goodnight. I want to play Archon. I want to play Load Runner. Um, Some all people in the, ch games. in the chat realm are saying, like, all oh, the graphics are too crap to play this game. You don't know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, grown up. Were, and to be honest, uh, all of my memories of this game are in uh, green because I had a monochrome. Monochrome, ooh. Yeah, Maybe I had a color you, Apple IIe, thankfully. Yeah, well, I mean, well, you could you could take an Apple IIe and actually hook it up to a television back in the day. Yeah, so yeah. You could've, I could have gotten color, but the the precision of the pixels was better on the on the green screen monochrome. But remember, it's like you had to make a choice: were you going to be green monochrome or amber monochrome? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This game, I remember Computer Lab. Uh, the, that's how I got it pirated, was we were taking breaks from learning a logo on the Apple IIe. And Dude, uh, I, I'm so fortunate in that the school I went to in Colorado, Littleton, Colorado, back in 1982, yeah. uh, second grade, we started learning how to program in logo. We yeah, same here. Same, same here. And uh, I had no idea at the time what a special thing that was. I mean, that's really amazing. That uh, you know, and of course nowadays it's it's uh, they're oh, what? Oh, does he make it? <laughs> I remember the funny thing is I, I remember not realizing at the time uh, you talk about I mean just the how fortunate it was to have access to a computer in school. I was in the the first year of the Gate program in California, which was the gifted advanced uh, kids. And I remember uh, it didn't dawn on me until years back just this is memory and realizing the stark contrast. But we were taken off once a week to go to the computer lab to get to mess around with logo and uh, you know for like a class period, a select group of us that I guess did well enough on whatever standardized IQ tests uh, got to go off and mess around in the computer lab, but. 
But then uh, when I came back into the class after learning Logo, seeing that uh, the rest of my classmates who didn't get to go were essentially uh, making those like uh, flashcard, uh, uh, like uh, lo-fi calculators using a milk carton where they would yeah. write like the problem on one end and the answer on there. And that's what they were doing while we were learning computers, you know? And it didn't occur to me years later, like, man, I was very fortunate and it probably screwed me up for the rest of my life. Just that sense of privilege at such a young age. Absolutely. You know, uh, man, this is, a, this is a great old one. Uh, uh, it also reminds me, same during that same time, it was Karatika yeah. and uh, <laughs> Ultima 3 Exodus. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was a good pick. Yeah. One one. Yeah. I mean, this is probably as far back as it goes. You know, I think for me, in terms of old school retro gaming, uh, I, don't know, I think I got. I guess I have one year on you physically, so yeah. I probably have one year of, of of game memories to go back. Yeah, there. but that that definitely is my favorite uh, of the console uh, style games. Uh, I guess it's time for our random awesome of the week. You know, I didn't put a link to the intro in the uh, thing. Do we still have it from last? We have it from last <laughs> week, though, right? Uh, yes, yeah, stand by. Okay, stand by. Stand by for our intro. Uh, Joshua Caleb, uh, who's going to be a guest next week on the show, uh, he uh, made us this little intro here. I didn't, uh, I don't have the newest version, uh, Joshua. I have uh, the one that we had before. So we're going to play that for our random awesome of the week. And uh, Joshua's going to be on with us next week to talk about, uh, well, a couple different things. But he, of course, does uh, awesome uh, retro gaming blog and podcast. So let's, uh, there we go. Woo! Yes. The that was well worth waiting for. Yes. And we have, he has a version he made for me with the sound effect. We have the sound effect also. He merged them together. Now we're playing them separately. Everybody's a winner. These will <laughs> merge together in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so our random awesome of this week is, uh, this video that I found on YouTube called The Worst of E3. And it's just some, some highlights of, of sort of fail from E3 2011, which, you know, we covered extensively on last week's show. Uh, Brian and I were there, covered it live from the show floor on Twit with Leo. And we're just going to play a little segment of this. Uh, I'll tweet the whole thing uh, out on my Twitter account. But uh, let's just watch a little bit of this video of the worst of E3 2011. Now, of course, having such an impressive set of network features and ambitions requires the nation's fastest mobile broadband network. And we'll be partnering with AT&T as the exclusive carrier for PlayStation Vita in the United States. <laughs> you guys with me? Cheap seats? Doing good? Okay. ADA, we do it a little different. We don't build elaborate stages and invite random celebrities for guest appearances. FIFA is more than just a video game. <laughs> oh, I was good. I love the game of soccer. I'm living my passion through FIFA. Lightsaber on! Need to get separated down here. So, I mean, basically, what I like about the compilation, yeah, please, like, you see this stuff all the time. These little glitches that happen when people try and do these live presentations. And he mentions in the uh, commentary of the video that he didn't include Nintendo because Nintendo didn't even try and uh, something this ambitious. What do you mean by try something this ambitious? Well, of doing, you know, the live demos because that's where everything really, really goes wrong, you know? I wonder what this game would have looked like had we released it long ago. Let's... Go back and you know, time. or people when they I do sort of the repetitive. I mean, these presentations get so I silly this sometimes. Could have all started when we all had a Commodore 64. <laughs> this is what we missed by not going to a lot of these press conferences. Everyone, do it with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So, okay, I'm putting uh, the link up to the whole thing on my Twitter. Uh, if you want to check it out, hit me up on uh, Twitter, Glenn Rubenstein. And uh, oh, I tweeted you can watch, as well. That's yeah. hilarious. You can watch the whole thing there. Oh, great. But no, I, I thought it was great to see. I know last week we talked about some of the best of E3, so I, I really enjoyed seeing so, so, some of the worst, and especially a lot of the stuff that we just skipped out on, you know? Uh, yes. Well, and it's good to just decide that everything we missed sucked because yeah. then we can talk about the awesome Sony executives that we parted with randomly. Yeah. Oh, man. It was funny. I, I mentioned to my brother. Whose party? My brother who works at Sony. Whose party we crashed? He was pretty impressed. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that he, is awesome. He was like, you didn't mention me, right? And I'm like, no, no, I did not. Uh, so next week. Uh, yeah, th- let's look at what's coming out next week. So next week, uh, let's look at our calendar. Now, th- we're going to try and do this feature every week. I'm finding it's hard to find a good calendar online of, of just titles that are set to launch. So I've kind of cobbled Especially this together. because nobody sticks to them. They're always changing. Yeah, them. yeah. And plus, and what's weird, because even the Amazon one uh, that I found was lacking a couple of things. But I mean, I guess the big game coming out uh, next week on the console. to the video game. <laughs> the one we're all looking forward to. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Of Lightning McQueen all around the world as he fights spies. <laughs> uh, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time for the 3DS. Never heard of it. <laughs> I, maybe, maybe it'll be good. Maybe it'll turn Thomas, into something. Did you see this commercial? I knew we'd be linked forever. For you, I traveled to the four corners of the world. I faced adversity. I became a hero. Dad. I saved your kingdom. Dad. Yes, Zelda? Are you mixing me up with the princess again? Hard to say. You're both pretty magical. <laughs> so, uh, Ocarina of Time, this is this is the exact game that... The old yes, game, but there's a master a challenge game. mode also, and a mirror mode. So, okay. but and oh, it's okay. 3D, and it's 3D. So, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, that commercial, obviously, I think people have been reacting like crazy to that commercial on the internet this week. Obviously, Robin Williams, such a huge Zelda fan that he named his daughter uh, after after the game, and uh, and the beard. I think the beard is quite epic. Uh, yes, in fact, people are confused. Bill Meek says Saddam Hussein loved Zelda. <laughs> I don't understand. Hey, you know, and then think about it. We, we, you know, we could talk about this more next week. But just think about all the, all the bad video game inspired names that we're going to be seeing coming as as time progresses on. You know, probably probably out there's there's some there's some uh, twelve twelve year old kid uh, named Duke. Whose, whose dad was a big fan back in the 90s. <laughs> He's just like, uh, listen, why don't we just tell everyone Duke is John short. Wayne. Richard. We named you after John oh, Wayne. Richard. We name you Richard, yeah. and we call you Duke for short. Yeah, Only exactly. We're calling you Duke anymore. Now we're just back to calling you Richard. That's yeah. what we're going to tell everyone, okay, sport? I, I tw- you know, I tweeted that that why if only he'd been you know a bigger Metroid fan, he could have named his daughter uh, Samus. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Rob Williams actually named his his daughter uh, Zelda after after the game The Legend of Zelda. And I remember hearing that story a lot back in the early '90s. So it's interesting how the Nintendo is is co opting that for their marketing around uh, Zelda's 25th anniversary of the game franchise. Apparently, Zelda Williams was actually at E3. Uh, they're giving interviews, and there's a lot of interviews online with her talking about sort of her history, just you know having that name associated. Uh, so famously with the game uh yeah well good i uh, are you gonna here's what i want to know are you gonna play it you know i don't have a 3ds i'm trying to get one so joshua don't feel too bad if you don't play that before your guest on next week's show because we might not get a chance to either but uh it's definitely one of the big games that's coming out this week tuesday i believe uh, uh I- be honest actually on the stuff i'm looking at right now the, yeah. i'm actually to be honest i'm distracted because i'm seeing that fear three is coming out fear three Dungeon Dungeon Siege Siege 3. three is coming out yep. um probably fear three is the most exciting thing this week for me shadows but, of the it, damned even then i won't actually get it what is shadows of the damned i know nothing it's, about that game they're they're damn shadows is what they are yeah. sir they're the damned and they cast shadows it is shadows of the damned <laughs> uh, is. gods and heroes that's the new mmo right that's coming out. I actually don't know. And what's funny is like, um, uh, I, I know a lot of these games um, in specific genres will be extraordinarily profitable and, and successful by targeting the people who love them most. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm just one of those guys that gets swooped. I, no, I guess I'm not because I know I, there are particular indie genres that I'm crazy mm-hmm. excited about. Um, because I'm seeing a lot of these games coming out I don't even recognize uh, or haven't heard m- much buzz about. You've not been highly anticipating Gummy Bear's Magic Medallion for the Wii? You beat me to it. You beat me to it. I'm looking <laughs> at it right now, and I'm like, I'm going to mention the Gummy Bears one, but you stole it from me. Oh, so I'm sorry. Screw you, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> So these are just some of the titles that are coming out Tuesday. Again, if you have any ideas how we can better do this calendar feature, I think, though, you know, it's the idea that we want to at least be able to talk about the titles that are upcoming. I mean, I think, I don't know, what do you think about that in terms of formatting, Brian? I mean, the well, idea here's that... What we do. Here's what yeah. we do. We can have uh, we can have a real quick, um, like, uh, let's say there's five games coming out. Then we yeah. have five games in a combat arena doing battle. <laughs> we decide which is the one that you should buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I like the idea of, of doing a calendar each week just to talk about what's coming out, doing a little bit of a look ahead to you know the week ahead and what's on the horizon, and then doing in terms of our big game segment because we've talked about it. and It's a little tough to do the actual like head to head, you know, at the movies style review. Right. Because we both can't play. I mean, just schedule wise, it's tough, and especially to do that for more than one game. Well, almost it, impossible. Takes, it takes and a lot of times to give a fair review to a game. You got to take yeah. more than to even finish the thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the idea that we're going to want to talk about what we're playing each week and then talking about what's coming out. I think that's probably the best way to balance it out. And then talking about the news, the hot topics, as it were. The, Not the, hot topics. The, you got to call I know. it. Uh, Lava level is just the LL is a little, uh, tricky but uh and uh, joshua was mentioning like game informer has a calendar and looked around and it's hard to find a really good in all-inclusive calendar of what's coming out and of course there's you know a lot of indie stuff on the pc scene and in fact i mean let me just say this to uh, to our listeners and faithful viewers out there if you have a game that you think we should be covering or a game you think we should check out by all means send us an email to twitgameshow at gmail.com or uh, you can send me a tweet I'm at Glenn Rubenstein and I mean let me know because you know during the week basically this show is is what I work on basically in terms of what I'm playing what I'm reading and what I'm checking out so if you think there's something that we should be tackling here on at the controls by all means hit us up and let us know and we'll do our best to at least you know give it some coverage if you think it's worthwhile Absolutely. And I guess that wraps it up for this episode of At the Controls. Close? Yeah. This, I guess this is, uh, you know, what, episode 0.7. Although I think, you know, with the studio move, I think we're actually going to hit 1.0, 1 1.1. 1 .1. We'll have to figure out how we're going to do this beta numbering. because like, so Then we get like one yeah. po uh, 0 0.9. 0 0.99. Yeah. <laughs> Before we, because we're getting there. I don't think we'll really be into, uh, you know, the finished thing. Oh, I wanted to give a shout also. Uh, let's see. Um, someone was uh Chucky e. J in the chat room was saying we should give a plug to the Mario Marathon Four trailer. Child's Play is doing it, and uh, when is that actually happening? The Mario Marathon Child's Play. I have no idea, and I gotta tell you, man, I'm just not sucked into the Nintendo universe. Like, uh, I, again, yeah. especially like people freaking out over over a, a re-release of a game that. that well, no, but know, this is just specifically this is an event that they do for the Child's Play charity. It's next weekend, so we can plug it more next week. Uh, it's because it is next Friday, so we can give it a more play next Friday. But essentially, I mean, they're using it. They're you know playing Mario. I correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the Mario games they're playing them in a marathon session, a sort of like a walkathon to raise money for the child's play charity so that's of course something that that we support and uh we'll the important question yeah. is are they driving underwater because that would be legit <laughs> how is that even possible that's that's how is that even possible <laughs> <laughs> but we'll uh, definitely plug them more next week it's going on next weekend if you have any interest i'm sure you can find it on the interwebs out there so uh let's do our official wrap up now uh, do we have our outro music so until next time we want to thank you all for tuning in and on behalf of brian brushwood and myself I'm Glenn Rubenstein reminding you that time enjoyed is never time wasted, especially when you're at the controls. See you next week. Good. With a, with a little bit long. A little long. Right, one hour, that, 44 minutes. A <laughs> little bit long, just a little bit long. This is what happens when you abandon us, Tom Merritt. <laughs> <laughs>